Today is the second Sunday after the Epiphany. The epistle for today's Mass is taken from the epistle of St. Paul to the Romans, chapter 12, verses 6 to 16. Brethren, having different gifts according to the grace that is given us, either prophecy to be used according to the rule of faith, or ministry in ministering, or he that teacheth in doctrine, he that exhorteth in exhorting, he that giveth with simplicity, he that ruleth with carefulness, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without dissimulation, hating that which is evil, cleaving to that which is good, loving one another with the charity of brotherhood, with honor preventing one another, in carefulness not slothful, in spirit fervent, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, instant in prayer, communicating to the necessities of the saints, pursuing hospitality. Bless them that persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that rejoice, weep with them that weep, being of one mind, one towards another, not minding high things, but consenting to the humble. Please stand for the Holy Gospel, that taken from St. John, chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. At that time there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And Jesus also was invited and his disciples to the marriage. And the wine failing, the mother of Jesus saith to him, They have no wine. And Jesus saith to her, Woman, what is that to me and to thee? My hour is not yet come. His mother saith to the waiters, Whatsoever he shall say to you, do ye. Now there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three measures apiece. Jesus saith to them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And Jesus saith to them, Draw out now and carry to the chief steward of the feast. And they carried it. And when the chief steward had tasted the water made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the waiters knew who had drawn the water, the chief steward calleth the bridegroom, and saith to him, Every man at first setteth forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Thus far the words of today's Holy Gospel. Please be seated. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today I will make some reflections on the subject of today's Gospel, the wedding at Cana. The setting for this gospel is not the wedding ceremony, but the wedding feast, that is, the extended formal meal that took place after the wedding ceremony. Today we would call this the dinner, which is served at the wedding reception. The fact that our Lord and his Blessed Mother were there meant that the wedding reception could not possibly have been like most modern wedding receptions, where there is almost always very indecent dress and behavior, horrid and disgusting music, wild partying and debauchery. If it were like this, then they certainly would not have dignified it by their presence, since their presence would have seemed to condone these things. So the first thing to consider here is that it is possible and not difficult to have a wedding reception which is holy, decent, and pious a reception that our Lord and Our Lady themselves would be quite happy to attend. Next, one might be inclined to think that the Son of God, through whom all things were made, to whom all power in heaven and earth had been given, sent into the world to conquer the power of the devil and to redeem and sanctify souls by his death on the cross, who would rise from the dead and ascend into heaven, one might think that he might not have the time or interest to attend a simple wedding feast of an obscure couple in a small town in Galilee. But no, that is not the case. He chooses to go to it. Why does he do this? He does this first 
to show that it is a very virtuous thing to give public support to couples by being present at their wedding. And second, he does it to bless and sanctify the holy state of matrimony. Our Lord foresaw that marriage would be routinely attacked in history by heretics, not only attacked as a sacrament, but also attacked as a natural institution. Time does not permit me to mention all the errors that have assailed the church in all these centuries in vain attempts to destroy marriage. But in our own days, the most devastating of these attacks was, without doubt, the 1983 Code of Canon Law, the official legal code of the modernists promulgated under John Paul II. This law book, which was originally an idea of John XXIII, has been effect in Novus Ordo contexts now for 40 years. In it, the traditional Catholic distinction between the primary purpose of marriage and the secondary purpose of marriage has been removed with surgical precision. The traditional Catholic teaching is that marriage has a primary purpose and a secondary purpose, also called primary end and secondary end. The primary end is the procreation and education of children. And the secondary end is for marriage to be a mutual support for the spouses and a remedy for concupiscence. Remedy for concupiscence means that without marriage, the human race would commit many sins of lust because of the effects of original sin. Marriage gives the spouses a legitimate, ordered context for the fulfillment of those desires which would otherwise be disordered. Now, this is a great good, but it is not the greatest good of marriage. It is a secondary good. The secondary end is subordinate to the primary end. The mutual support and remedy for concupiscence is good, but it is not as great a good as having children and raising children. Children are the primary essential purpose of marriage. Now, this attack on the essential subordination of ends, which is really an attack on children, was a goal of the modernists long before Vatican II. They were seeking it even in the days of St. Pius X. This is because the modernists have always loved impurity. Their most consistently taught position on moral matters is that sins of impurity are not grave sins or perhaps not even sins at all. Indeed, it is not only that they love impurity, they want to legitimize all impure things. But one thing stands in the way of them achieving this goal, the Church's teaching that children are the primary essential purpose of matrimony. They hate this teaching because it necessarily means that acts not ordered to having children and raising children, which is to say all sins of lust, are sins against the natural law and are gravely sinful. However, the modernists could not outright dismiss this teaching as false, since that would too obviously give away their position. Instead, they cleverly devised a compromise strategy. They placed the mutual help of the spouses and the having of children on the same level, as if they were equal goods. This compromise strategy, clever as it may seem, is against the explicit teaching of the Church, against the natural law, and against reason. It is as absurd as saying that the purpose of a car is to have some place to sit, and also to help you go places. Yes, you can sit in a car, but the main reason, the primary purpose for having a car, is to help you go to places. Secondarily, they are also places to sit. But travel is the essential primary purpose of the car. 
In the same way, the essential primary reason for marriage is to have children and to raise those children. Secondarily, it is true, it provides mutual support. But those two things are not of equal importance. The equalization of ends, as was done by the modernists, was condemned as inadmissible under Pope Pius XII. The Holy Father said that the teaching that the secondary ends are of equal value with the primary end and independent of it cannot be admitted. Thus does the Code of 1983 stand condemned by the Catholic Church's magisterium. It is a product of the filthy minds of modernists. The result is that there is just as much divorce in the Novus Ordo as there is in the rest of society. Faithful Catholic marriages are one of the greatest witnesses to the world of the holiness of our religion. The indissolubility of the marriage bond is a very powerful sign of the indissolubility of the bond between Christ and the Catholic Church. Tear down Catholic marriage and you tear down the Catholic Church. That was exactly the intention of the modernists. Of course, they have failed to tear down the Church, but they still dealt tremendous damage to souls. All must understand that marriage is not about the fulfillment of internal desires. This is a selfish and self-centered way of looking at marriage. It's all about what I get out of it. No. Rather, it is essentially selfless. It is ordered not to oneself, but to other persons. And those persons are primarily the children, and secondarily, the spouses. Our Lord foresaw this modern attack on marriage. He foresaw all future attacks on marriage that would ever occur in history. And for this reason, he shows that he approves of marriage by his presence at this wedding. The next thing to consider in the gospel is that the wine was failing. Our Lady anticipates a possible embarrassing situation for the spouses by noticing that they have run out of wine. This observation is also a modest and tactful request made of our Lord that he miraculously supply their lack of wine by uh, a miracle. Now, up until this point, our Lord had not done any miracles that we know of, at least not publicly. He had not yet given to the public the external proof of his being the Messiah. And once he began to perform miracles, then his public ministry would officially commence, a three-year ministry which would end in his crucifixion and death. Hence, he says, woman, what is that to me and to thee? My hour has not yet come. He means that it is not yet time for him to carry out the mission that his father sent him to accomplish. Now, this might leave us wondering, are not all times in God's hands? Will God not act according to the proper times that he has arranged from all eternity? Of course he will. And yet, he allows himself to appear here as if his mission to redeem the world is under the influence of Our Lady. Just as her fiat was the occasion for, the begin- for his becoming incarnate in her womb, so her modest request for this miracle is the occasion for the manifestation of his divinity. He is very pleased to allow her words to have an influence on him. We find many examples of a similar nature in the lives of the saints. There was a 40-year-old man living in Siena in the year 1370 who was overcome by a fatal disease and was bedridden. He had never in his life even set foot in a church, and he had no respect for priests whatsoever. When the priest came to see him to hear his confession and administer extreme unction, he scoffed at him and would not confess. Many God-fearing people who were close to him were in anxiety for his eternal salvation. 
the state of this man's soul came to the attention of St. Catherine, who immediately turned to prayer. And our Lord spoke to Catherine during her prayer and said, Not only has he blasphemed me and my saints, but he also threw a panel that contained a painting of me with my holy mother and others of my saints into the fire. Therefore, it is only right that he should burn likewise in the everlasting fire. But St. Catherine persevered. She said to him, Why speak to me of this unfortunate man's faults? When you bore all our faults on your most holy shoulders, do not cast me off, most merciful Lord. Give me back my brother, now engulfed in the abyss of his obstinacy. She stayed up all night long, praying in a similar way for the salvation of this man. At dawn, the man suddenly cried out, Send for a priest, I want to confess. I can see the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ telling me to confess my sins. Those present around him heard him and were astonished and filled with joy. They sent for a priest. And with an outpouring of grief for his sins, and with complete clarity, the man made a full confession and a fully detailed last will and testament. Shortly afterward, he died. Thus, the invincible and unconquerable God allows himself to be conquered by the petitions of his mother and the tears of his saints. The next point about today's gospel is that the jars, which the waiters filled with water, were used for the customary Jewish ritual washings. The general opinion is that the jars were, on average, about seven and a half gallons. Six of them would be equal to about 230 bottles of wine. This excessive amount shows the generosity of our Lord which is also a sign of the generous graces that he would obtain for us by his death. Not just any jars were selected for this miracle, but the jars for ceremonial washing. This is significant. It conveys the idea that the Jewish ceremonial law, which involved washing rituals, would no longer be in force as a result of the promulgation of the sacraments. The miraculous wine here foreshadows Christ's most precious blood in the Holy Eucharist. This blood is the eternally pleasing sacrifice which renders obsolete all the sacrifices and all the ceremonies of the old law. St. Paul wrote, For it is impossible that with the blood of oxen and goats sin should be taken away. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and oblation thou wouldst not, but a body thou hast fitted to me. He means by this that the sacrifices of lambs and oxen, although prescribed in the old law, could not take away sin, nor could they satisfy God's justice. It is God's will that the sacrifice which does take away sin is the sacrifice of his own son's body and blood. We should also note that it is not only wine that is produced by this miracle, but a wine of superior excellence. After tasting it, the head waiter goes to the bridegroom and makes some remarks about its high quality. He says that it is the usual practice to serve the good wine first and the inferior wine second. This is because food and drink taste better at the beginning of the meal than they do at the end of the meal. The sense of taste is more sensitive at the beginning and can better appreciate the tastes of things but by the end of the meal, the sense of taste is dull. But in this case, the good wine is served at the end of the meal instead of the beginning. There's a deeper meaning to this. The miraculous wine of superior quality symbolizes the blood of our Lord, which is shed not in the beginning of history, but in the final age of history. And the old wine of inferior quality symbolizes the blood of the animals offered in the old law, which, although foreshadowing the new law, did not take away sin. 
And the old law was served first in history, whereas the new law is served last. We conclude this reflection by mentioning the fact that the couple who were married at Cana chose to honor Our Lady in a special way at their wedding reception. Our Lady is the first one mentioned at the wedding reception by St. John. She seems to be fulfilling a managerial role at the wedding. The head waiter's attention is on her. She is the one commanding the head waiter. We can gather from this that this couple was very close to Our Lady, and that they have chosen to honor her does not go unnoticed by our Lord. He is, of course, always pleased when his mother is honored. And so it is only fitting that our Lord should will to express his good pleasure to the spouses by performing this miracle for them. If our Catholic marriages also honor Our Lady, then she will obtain for the whole family graces from her Son in the same way that she obtained the wine of superior excellence for the spouses in Cana. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.